Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I am your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from across Canada to learn about them, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on this show that the best way to understand a community is to actually talk to the people who live and work in said community. That is why we are honored and pleased to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome Councillor Tanya Fubert of the town of Canmore in the province of Alberta. Councillor, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. So, Tanya, I want to start with the question I've asked all municipal leaders and all municipal politicians. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Ooh, the origin story. That's let's a, go. <laughs> let's go a, back to the origin story. The origin story. Um, well, I have a very strong sense of service um, that has really developed out of uh, sobriety um, and recovery from alcohol addiction. And I don't know if a lot of people realize that um, within, like, the twelve-step community, the twelfth step is about being of service. Uh, and um, so, you know, part of that journey, when I started that journey, I was already a journalist at the local newspaper in Canmore. And I'll also I'll add as well that I was born and raised in Canmore. A, a month after the mines closed, I was born here. And so I've seen this place change. Um, and my level of commitment and sense of community um, has evolved over the time that I've both lived here and worked in journalism um, because community journalism is, is one of those jobs that can um, be really difficult, but also really, really amazing. And I'd say the same thing about being an elected official, you know, when you are able to affect change and to help someone solve a problem or, you know, achieve a, a, an outcome or a priority that you have, or the community has, it feels amazing. But sometimes along the way, there's, you know, a lot of more difficult things that you got to do. Um, but yeah, I was when I was a journalist, um, it, I think it was seven years ago, seven, and eight years ago, where I decided that I needed to make changes in my life. I was not I was using really bad habits to cope with stress. And I got sober. And that was a journey in and of itself. And within that journey, I really discovered that the things that were really important to me, were a foundation upon which I um, I had values built um, and were and connection and support was my community. Um, my whole my whole family is here still or in Cochrane nearby. Um, and this is the place I've known. And so just this starting to realize how doing the work of of community journalism at the local paper was actually supporting this community, supporting democracy, and informing people about what's going on, that gave me a real sense of um, meaningfulness and connection. And so, and I knew, I, I was there for 15 years at the paper, and I knew it was time for a change. And when I looked around, it was like, there's not really a lot of other journalism jobs in the Valley, although CBC now has a reporter here. Um, as a temporary assignment, uh, the being an elected official seemed like a natural um, progression and evolution for me. And I'd already spent 15 years covering council. There's no one alive who spent more time in Canmore council chambers than me, but I've only been able to vote for the past year and a half. So it was, it kind of like, there were all these things that, that led to it. And, um, I have no regrets. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack with that opening statement. First off, I've done, as of this recording, over 550 of these episodes. And you are the first person to finally point out the fact that the first question I ask goes back to Alcoholics Anonymous as someone who has been sober as well. It I <laughs> came up with the question because of that, because the service to your community comes a long way. And in those 12 steps, while you may believe in AA, you may follow everything that AA has, the 12 steps are needed. 
and service is one of them. And you were the very first person to point that <laughs> out. And I'm kind of shocked it took this long, but here we are. Um, so thank you Daniel, for that. Um, I want I want to go back to growing up because you don't just randomly decide one day you're going to put your name into the political re- arena. It is a long standing story that people have a desire, but they're not sure when or how. But I want to go back to growing up in Canmore. Was politics discussed at the dinner table? Was municipal politics discussed at the dinner table? Because when I sit down with politicians, they say, oh, federal politics was, provincial politics was, not really municipal, though. Not really. Um, my I grew up in a single parent um, household. And so, and my mom was pretty reserved on her political opinions she didn't she didn't want to be like i'm this so you have to be this and think that way she kind of was like you i'm not going to tell you how i vote you need you need to decide for yourself um and i i have vague memories of things happening like in the 90s i remember the olympics i was eight right i was just like there was a huge party at the nordic center and i was just so excited and someone had photocopied $50 bills on, on to little pink sheets of paper. And I thought it was real money. And I was like, I have look at all this money I found. It was not real money. Oh. Um, and <laughs> which was when I learned it's illegal to photocopy currency. <laughs> so I don't know who did that. Um, and then I remember the debates around development in the early 90s from afar. But you know, municipal politics is one of those areas where, you know, it doesn't get it doesn't get as heated on as as much of a conversation um, starter or something that carries that conversation as much as federal and provincial politics. And I think that's more because at those levels, you really there's like a lot of concepts and and ideologies and ideas and big macro vision and and, you know, things you want where you want to take everyone. But the municipal level, it's like when you really dial it down, it's pretty, sometimes really boring, but also so fundamentally important to the every aspect of our daily lives. So like water, wastewater, garbage, recycling, um, snow and ice clearing or removal. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, it does, we, no one really talks policy at the municipal level. They're more like, they need to clear the roads more or my taxes are too high. And so getting into um, journalism is where, I, like I'm a giant nerd and an overachiever and a recovering perfectionist as well. So getting into journalism is where I started to understand processes because here I was, uh, it was 2006 I finished at Mount Royal. I got an internship at the Canmore Leader, which doesn't exist anymore. And immediately, like even some of the stories I wrote about that first month there are still things that are issues that now I'm dealing with as a counselor. And when I started to be assigned things like there was a by-election and going to council and going to the planning commission, I really started to understand that I was fascinated and curious about the system and the process like how does this all work right who gets to decide what and how do they make those decisions and I think that those are things that can be a real black box for people in their community and so for me in terms of like the community journalism I practiced um, I was there to build community through understanding of issues and I felt that if people understood how things worked and what was going on, that they'd be more engaged. And the more engaged people are, I think you get better decisions because then they see themselves in the decisions and they don't feel alienated or disenfranchised or like, here's this group of people who decide things for me, but they have like, they don't care what I think, right? So I was at like, I was at that bridge. Um, And then soon, six months after I started at the leader, the Rocky Mountain Outlook, the other paper in town, poached me. <laughs> and I spent pretty much 15 years there, other than I spent a year in Whistler, which was 
<laughs> it's a whole other episode probably um so you, but yes you, you get involved Sorry. in the in the newspaper and you're you're writing about the community um 15 years goes by after starting in the newspaper business in Canmore and in 2020 2021 I don't I don't know exactly when you decided you were going to put your name forward but you start thinking to yourself okay, it's time to put up or shut up. It's time to change directions of what I'm doing. And I'm going to go from being behind the media desk and council chambers to be behind, being behind that council chambers desk. So take me through the process of what made you make the leap to go, okay, let's do, let's put my name forward in this election, 2021, because I think my voice is the best that could bring a different perspective to council. Yeah. And I think like, like 15 years, like I feel, still feel really young. So, but that's a huge chunk of time to, to spend at a job, um, especially the fact that it was almost all at the same newspaper. And then also just completely enmeshed and, and engaged in everything that was going on. I found that, you know, I could, I, I was able to occupy a space of objectivity and try and, and get, voices and perspectives and and write my stories from that but I was also at the same time really invested and I felt like I cared and I thought you know I'm I'm a person who would be able to do that well and so I I was occupying more of subjectivity Okay. I was like, I started like, and as an editor, you do have to write editorials. So you do have to um, come at things from a positional point. And sometimes as I would just take a different position that I held, right? D like, because I, it didn't have to always be about me. But the, the, I had such a foundation of knowledge and experience that it was, I was more and more finding myself in a place of, of, having an idea of what direction I wanted to go instead of, and so, and, and I didn't, I'm not trying to imply that I wasn't able to do my job as a journalist anymore, but I wanted to be a different chess piece on the board, right? I wanted to make different moves and I wanted to help. I wanted to be part of making decisions in a different way as the media. You're, you're part of that landscape. You're, you're a player on the board but what you can do and how you can affect um, how everything is moving is a lot different than say um, being on council. Um, I do miss being at the paper. Uh, like, and, and I find that part of my challenge as a council member has been to get out of the mindset of a journalist of being on the outside and realizing I'm on the inside and this is, and I'm part of a team and we actually function best if we work together. So I'm so used to being this quantity on the outside looking in um, and really singularly look like independent and <laughs> like violently independent. Like, well, you can't tell me what to do. And um, so, so it, I don't ahead. know if that made sense, but it, I, it does but yeah, it just... because it, it jumps into this question because for someone who, like myself, I covered us. I, I worked at a small, uh, small town newspaper, a weekly newspaper back in Ontario before moving it west. And I can tell you that small town newspapers are where the news is actually made. CBC is great, CTV is great, but the small town newspapers, you get the feel, you get the pulse of the community. So for you, you you kind of have a unique situation here where. For 15 years, you've been telling the stories of all these different people, of all these different council, or all these councils, all these residents. And now you're going to flip the uh, script and say, how can I help you? I've helped you tell your stories. Now, if I'm elected, how can I help you better yourself in your uh, town? So during that campaign in 2010, while it was the height of the pandemic and door knocking was a little iffy, but it still was happening. Did you hear more macro issues or did you hear more micro issues like parks, playgrounds, potholes, or was it healthcare, education, infrastructure? It was kind of in between. It's kind of um, micro, like macro issues in a micro level, mm -hmm. right? So things like um, public engagement, um, 
housing affordability and housing availability. That's like the big one here. Um, but it's not necessarily a municipal jurisdiction or area of expertise. Um, if I've learned uh, one thing about doing these interviews, everything is a municipal issue these days. <laughs> yeah, it's true, right? Like, and that's just it's even even when it's something that someone comes to you with that isn't your jurisdiction, you actually have the power to connect them, right? So like you have the power to be like, hey, here's the ML, here's the MLA, here is the provincial department, here is a service Alberta. This is where you need to go to um, find more information or effect, like you can be a conduit to solutions. So um, even if you're not the solution, I think that um, that election, it was tough because of COVID and the lack of door knocking. And I tried really hard to, I was out there, I was at all the events. Um, I had tried to hold my own events and no one want, no one came. No one wanted to talk to me. It was really weird. It was really weird. I was just like. Did they like, not want to like, talk I'm, to you because you were a former journalist and you would tell stories in the newspaper? Or did they just not want to talk to you because of the apathy aspect of municipal politics where not a lot of people care and i'm not trying to be rude to municipal councillors but yeah. apathy is a massive thing in this country when it comes to municipal governments no one's engaged in my opinion i think the people that are engaged already had a sense of me right they because not only did i have the newspaper for 15 years but i spent eight years um hosting a weekly morning radio show on the local radio station live talking about what's going on. So people didn't know where I was coming from on things. They weren't tuned into those, um, those types of media. And most, I think our voters here, even though it's like 30 to 40% voter turnout, the people who vote are the people paying attention. So they had already like sussed me out, right? Like, no, I'm, I know how I feel about you. I want to focus my attention on who else of my votes are, where am I going to cast my other votes? Because for um, those who are were... listening, the town of Canmorbys, we have listeners outside of Alberta, is that in an at-large district. So every councillor is elected like the mayor. Everyone gets to vote for six. I'm not sure how many councillors are in Canmore, six. but I think six and then seven yeah. as the mayor. So it is an at-large. In Ontario, it's a little bit different. Quebec, it's a little bit different. So just want to give that perspective out there. Yeah. So I got I got the sense that people already understood me Um and had a position, a new, and if they didn't, they reached out by email, you know, or we had a conversation, but I didn't feel like I was as engaged. So, you know, I'm really excited that in the future, there will be door knocking for me. Um, but, but that's just it. I spent so long really taking the pulse of the community, trying to understand what's the ethos, what's, what's the, uh, the emotional tolerance of change, what's, you know, where are people at? And I was pretty good at it. And um, and it's just like lots of connections and lots of always having conversations. And then you don't even realize you're having conversations that inform you about where people are at. So I've, I've, I felt that at the time, people thought I had a really good sense of the community. Um, they appreciated my perspective. Um, and my opinions when, you know, when, you know, I have, there are a lot of people who really enjoyed my editorials, for example, <laughs> which is an art form. Writing rhetoric is an art form. Um, and, and those so are the ones that you I, often always hear about on the on yeah. the corner or the, the, the grocery store. But I want to talk about election day for a second here, because I've had the pleasure to vote for myself. And it's a, a surreal experience seeing your name on the ballot. I will have that ingrained. I, I'm pretty sure I know you're not supposed to take uh, pictures of your ballot, but I'm pretty sure I took n numerous photos of that ballot that day. Um, for you, what was that experience like seeing your name on the ballot? Because you've seen your name in print. I saw my name in print before, but seeing it on a ballot where there's a little circle where people can actually tell you really if they like you or not by voting for you or believe that you're the best person for the job. What was that experience like for you? I think it, it was really overwhelming. Um, and like, I struggle sometimes with like, um, self doubt. And, um, you know, they, I think they call it imposter syndrome, like, you know, I don't, 
always, you know, you know, I'm not really the best judge of my own abilities sometimes because uh, there's a little voice in my head <laughs> that's really hypercritical. And so it was super overwhelming to just like say to my, like to my community, pick me. Like, I'm here to serve. Do you want me? And so like, it was like, there's a whole bunch of nausea that comes with that because it's like, you know, do they, do they like me? And it's like, it's not about like, it's about respect. Do they respect my abilities to be able for, to fulfill this role for the next four years? And that do they think that if they have a, an issue or a challenge that I'll be there to listen and help? Because, you know, I think that uh, elected officials really do serve sometimes as a um, a way to resolve issues and problems and right conflict. And it could be it could be all sorts of things. Um, and you might not, you might it might be just connecting them, it might just be listening, or it might be like, actually, I can help you. So, you know, did they feel that I would be there for them? And then um, at the end of the day, they did. You yeah. get elected <laughs> and you get that little blue check mark beside your name, or however the town of Canmore presented it out, that you are the next councillor elect for the town of Canmore. Um, you never run to lose an election, but you always prepare yourself in the back of your mind that there's a possibility because nothing is ever guaranteed for you hearing that news. What was that feeling like? And how long did it take from going from celebratory to, oh no, now the real work begins. Mm, I would say it's kind of one of the biggest, um, non-chemically induced rushes I've ever experienced <laughs> right I was like I, it was like a major serotonin drop I was just like I was just like ah. I get like this is amazing I last I think it lasted a, a couple days um but like I it was interesting because there are three new councillors voted in and three incumbents and then a new mayor. And so of the, of the newly elected, the rookies, right? Like I already had knowledge and experience and like, I understand, like I'm already reading agenda packages, right? I would go to committee meetings and cover like the different committees. So I under I had a real sense of like what followed after that. Um, and we went into our orientation, we did our, we had our, um, swearing in ceremony. I, I wish I had have invited more family to that because I didn't realize how meaningful and symbolic that occasion was going to be. Um, I had a real sense of two, um, my grandpa and my grandma and my grandma on, on my dad, my mom's side and my grandma on my dad's side who have passed and my aunt's. Um, who were all parts of this community, just being really proud that I was carrying on. Um, like what I was doing was something um, that continued the legacy of, you know, what our family has really stood, like our values internally of, you know, being involved and um, building community and so it, like that was like I was just like this is it like this is you doesn't get better than this right like because all that other stuff hasn't started right um like uh, the processes of like strategic setting your strategic plan and prioritizing and and just really kind of understanding like I understood things from the outside looking in but now I'm on the inside what are the dynamics how do, I'm, I knew everyone, but I'm actually technically a new group member. Mm -hmm. And there are group dynamics at play. There are um, ways that people have always done things. And a few things really kind of started to pop out to me, uh, like pick your battles, right? Like, what are you actually going to focus your energy on um, uh, and try and change? Because it can't be everything. <laughs> if you, everything's a priority Agreed. nothing's a priority so um i have a weird yeah. question for you because you're the first person 
Well, you're the third person who was a journalist turned to a politician municipally that I've had on this show in the last few months. Uh, James Miller from Penticton, B.C. and uh, Lisa Sigatech from uh, Crow's Nest Pass. All work in the media business. All are now counselors. You're right. There's a there's a group dynamics that come into play when you get elected and there's an atmospheric change how people perceive you at City Hall compared to when you're sitting in the gallery compared to when you're sitting behind those chairs. You had covered the city or the town for some time and I would say 15 years. I'm not sure if there was times that you were just specifically the City Hall beat or whatever. But when you got elected and in your time since then, have you noticed people semi changing their perspectives of how they thought of you compared to what they thought you were like as a reporter? Because as a reporter, you have to ask the tough questions. You have to dig deep and you can't sort of BS people because I remember covering City Hall in Lloydminster, Alberta. People would hate me when I would come in because I would ask them questions and they go, that's not a story question. Like, no, it is a story because people are asking about it. So as a counselor compared to a journalist, you're in the same realm, but you're now asking questions for the betterment of the community, not to try and get the scoop of the story. Do you think the, the perception changed from uh, the people inside city hall for you? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, it's I know that like, I'm really, a big fan of Brene Brown and the concept that everyone is doing the best that they can. And so I try and really bring that. Um, and I try and also um, honor the fact that I'm a rookie and I, I don't know. Um, and that that actually um, work. That's an asset for me because I can ask questions from the space of a rookie of like, I don't understand why this works this way. Can you know, can you help explain it to me? Um, I think that for me, the biggest challenge has been um, threading this needle, um, so to speak, of, of being asked, being critical, asking critical questions, you know, um, uh, trying to hold a role of accountability and oversight and, and be able to challenge a bit without being received as disrespectful or criticizing. Right, because there's a difference between asking a tough question and being disrespectful, but how a person receives that can be an influence on it as well as how I deliver. And so, you know, there, you know, and I've also had small, some struggles with, um, like, I'm a trauma survivor. And I, there was one example of a meeting where something was happening outside of the room that was really affecting me. And I, I went, I went all like, I, I crashed into hypo arousal. Like I went right down. I was just like, I like, I withdraw all my emotions. I don't even want to, I'm done. I withdraw. And like, I, so I didn't, I functioned poorly in that scenario and no one could know on the outside what was happening on the inside. Um, and that, you know, I was having a, a panic attack, essentially. And so, you know, I've had to work through, I worked through that and, and the, the, I worked through the trigger. So now it's not a thing that affects me, but I didn't know that that trigger was going to be there that day. So I had no way to prepare. Um, and then um, I tried to just be really, and then vulnerability is hard, I think, as a politician, you know, um, I don't know how many politicians admit to being like a recovering alcoholic, but I, I think it actually works in my favor because it shows not I a lot. Change. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think there are some some great characteristics you gain and strength from sobriety. But um, I found that just being honest and being vulnerable and sharing help people understand um, me better so that in the future, um Right, because that could come across as like I'm just being an asshole, right? Or sorry, so oh, we, oh. we've had politicians okay. smoke marijuana on the show, so it is not that okay. type of show where everything okay. needs to be PG. <laughs> and it was provincial right? politicians who are about to go back and try to find that politician, look through the provincial run, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it was coming across that I was being rude and disrespectful, right? And and so 
you know, I think that um, in ter- like there might be a better sense of me um, as a, you know, a flawed human being now and that, you know, I'm tr- trying my best, but it's not always going to be perfect. And so I'm hoping, I hope that like kind of living that truth doesn't turn to a negative. Uh, and I don't think it does because, you know, there's a lot of strength in just being honest about um, when you're really challenged or when something is going on. And then other people in a similar situation might feel like, okay, it's okay for me to say this is too much for me. I need a break. So um, like, that's a really great example where, you know, I think that initially there was this perception of the way I was behaving, but really underneath there was a whole nother story and um, I was able to have trust in, in the dynamic between council and, and the CAO and senior admin to be like, listen, I'm like, I, this is the human being that I am. And I have PTSD. And this is sometimes it's hard for me. And from now on, I make a commitment to speaking up when I need space instead of allowing myself to, or not allowing, but like staying in a situation where my behavior can come across as um, really unhelpful to what we're trying to do here. And there's this whole, like, because like, there's this whole group dynamic around council and admin and how everything works. And you really want to be productive and you really want to work towards consensus building Um, But sometimes, you know, you're going to disagree. And how do we create space for that? And then also, how do we create space for people to be flawed human beings, you know, Um, and imperfect? And like, and I think that is really great, because um, we have to be open minded. And sometimes you have to change your mind. And if you can, if you can go from one position to another position on something, then you're actually just showing that you have the qualifications to be in that seat because you've listened, you've considered, and you're in a different place. And I think that, um, you know, being able to really kind of come at things with an honest, like, this is why I have this perspective at at this point in time and why, uh, can really open, like, create great debate and dialogue, increases understanding. And I don't think we need to, as municipal politicians or elected officials, be perfect. And I Shockingly, think that, I agree with you. I think a yeah, lot of municipal yeah. politicians <laughs> and politicians in general just have to realize that they're not God's gift to this world and people do make mistakes and you're only human when you actually admit those mistakes. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, go, it goes so far. It goes so far to say, you know what? I think I was wrong on this and this is what's changed my mind. Sorry. Counselor. I just realized we're a half hour into this and I want to turn to segment two now. And segment two is a pretty big one. And I want to preface this question by saying this, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is her opinion. So counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this, what is the biggest issue facing the town of Canmore today? Or issues, I should say. Well, uh, well, that's easy. That's an easy one. <laughs> um, I would, I would uh, categorize it as wealth inequality. What do you mean by and that? Underneath wealth, wealth inequality. So they actually measure it in the census. It's called the Gini coefficient. Canmore has the highest w- level of wealth inequality in all of Canada in the last two federal censuses. And so that really is an umbrella term for me, covers off a number of things. It covers off uh, like uh, um, the types of jobs and wages that are available, uh, the cost of living in our community and the availability and affordability of housing. Now, like housing is the the big one. Um, Right now, our living wage is $32 an hour. And that is really high. I don't know if anywhere is higher. Um, Rental rates in Canmore are equivalent to Vancouver and Toronto. So like 
right now, if you want to just rent a room in someone's house, the average cost is a thousand dollars. For a, a room bucks doesn't even for a room, just a room. You share a bathroom, you share a kitchen, but you get a room. Sometimes you might have your own bathroom. So, but it is it is it is it is redonkulously expensive here. Um, it is driving is. It has for 20 years always been on this trajectory and uh, there's uh, it is a huge frustration and concern in the community and rightfully so, but at, the struggle is, is that at the municipal level, you can only do certain things or so much, right? Like there are things at provincial and federal levels that would be game changers, to help us address these things as a community. What but would you, be the first? What those... would be your top priority for the federal or provincial government to change to address the wealth inequality? Uh, universal basic income could be a game changer. I know that's a you know, people think that's a, it is kind of a wild idea out there, and I think it's at a federal level. But if you, so I basically worked two to three jobs since 2005 here without stop, even as editor of the newspaper, I had other jobs. I've, you know, serving, um, I was a breakfast chef for a while. I had that radio show gig. Even now as a counselor, I got to work a second job because council doesn't pay enough to live in Canmore. It's, it, it, it's not even the living wage. <laughs> so, um, but I successfully put forward a motion to create a committee to review our remuneration before the next election. So uh, I, I have a process to solve that issue at play. But um, at a provincial level, um, I would say, or okay, at a federal, okay, provincial level, rent control would be good inclusionary zoning, uh, which would have been a godsend 20 years ago. We wouldn't even be in this situation if we had that tool in our toolbox as a municipality. Um, and because every developer who's built, we would have had, we could have been able to require them to provide housing for the community at the same time. So, you know, um, right now, like the average price, I think of a single detached dwelling is like 1.5 million. Townhouse is around 900 to a mil. Um, and a condo is like 700,000, right? Like 700, like that's that's not doable for people. Is what's anymore. the vacancy so, rate like in Canmore right now? Is it high or is it very low? Very low. Zero. It's all like pretty much zero. Banff as well. And before COVID, um, the council had approved um, three new projects. One that was their own initiative uh, as a P three, but they were all rental buildings, right? So there were like two hundred and fifty new units of rental into the market. We hadn't built a single rental building since like the early 80s in this town by definition of an apartment building where it's all owned by one person and rented out instead of a condo building. And COVID, they just filled up because all of a sudden there is this new factor at play that people could um, work from home from anywhere. And so people who could afford to live in Canmore and work from home were like, boom, I'm doing it. I'm living my dream in the mountains. And I get it because I'm living my dream in the mountains <laughs> and it's a beautiful place. And, and like, that's just it. Like the level of demand to be here is way higher than the supply that we have. I think some other creative solutions from a federal provincial level is there are some, I believe, oh, and I'm kind of, I'm fuzzy on the details, but I believe in Northern Alberta, there is like a, a region where you get a tax credit or, yep. or, or um, for the federal for tax. Or, yeah. No, Northern living expense. North the, the, I, I got it when I was up in uh, slave Lake. So I, I took advantage of that many times. <laughs> yeah. So, and I don't know if that would be kind of like a universal basic income type support. Then there is like um, all of the, the types of programs that the provincial and federal government have to support families like child tax credits and things, there is an income threshold in order to get those. But in Canmore, you have to make so much money that the people who need those here don't qualify, right? And so I'd like to see some sort of overlay district 
or some sort of a program that's that has a different income threshold for families um, in this region specifically, like Jasper Banff Canmore, really specifically, um, that basically acknowledges that you know you, you know you might you make that much money in other, any other town, you're in a whole different income bracket. You're able to afford these things in Canmore, no, you know, um, and then. Uh, what uh, what are, so, those are my those are a good summary of some of the ways that I think that those levels of government could help more. So it seems like there's a lot of advocacy work that you're doing, whether it be with the provincial government or with the federal government, your MP or MLAs. Are you being heard? Do you think this issue, because it doesn't seem like this issue is one that you just randomly picked off to the top of your head and it's been going on for some time now, because you talk about something that should have been fixed 20 years ago and we wouldn't be in this mess. So do you feel like you're being heard? Do you feel like the council's being heard? And I, I, I use the Royal Council as the entire body, but also you because you're part of it. Well, some of the things that um, we've been working towards include this concept of like a visitor-based economy or a resort municipality status in BC. Um, and it's, it's never taken off provincially. No, There's been no government that has like, been like, you know what? That's a great idea. We're going to back you, including the NDP government when they were here in power in Alberta. Um, there was a lot of listening and trying to understand. And we've done a number of reports. But the closest we've gotten was this this turnaround when our current MLA, uh, Miranda Rosen, who's Secretary of Tourism, and she, a member of the UCP party, she actually uh, tabled a private member's bill on the last day in the legislature to create a visitor-based um, community status in the MGA. Now, that would eventually lead to being able to access grant funds because you know, like Canmore, Banff and Jasper, taxpayers are paying more to provide services because of the high visitation. And we have these things in Alberta called intramunicipal collaboration frameworks, which are about setting out the terms of, you know, you got a, a, an urban center and then you have rural, but the rural residents use services in the urban center. And so you have these agreements of um, like our surrounding municipal district of Bighorn, we have like agreements on recreation or should, and snow plowing, like you can share services but where their residents use one of our municipally provided services, they provide a bit more, they fund that. And that you you work out what the number is. And I think that like we can more ban Jasper needs one of those with the whole province. Yeah. Because the whole province is coming here and you like they're using, they use our roads. Heck, the whole country's toilets. coming there. <laughs> right. But like and, and like I just try always trying to creatively find a way to get um to help politicians at a different level try and understand you know what this doesn't this isn't just about our community this is about the fact that y'all come here and you want us to be here for you you want all these all these amazing things we need signage we have trails but we as taxpayers are the only ones paying for that even though it's kind of, it, it is a tourism factor and so the private members bill is the closest we've ever gotten to anything hitting the floor, but there's always this resistance because truly every community is unique and has unique needs. And so if you take out these three towns and you say, well, we're gonna make the special category for them, there's gonna be a, like, there's this like downstream effect of other groups of towns or towns being like, me too, me too. Well, exactly. Then there but could like, be like the drum that's... hellers that say, well, we're a tourist town as well, or uh, down South with Waterton National Park, the we're a town as well. So there's, it's a, it's a unique situation you've put yourself in, not you, but the town is uh, put themselves into because you're right. You are a tourist community, but you also are a community and nonetheless, um, and I want to go back to the question, though. You talk about your yes. issues. You talked about wealth inequality. You talked about tourism. You talked about uh, a ba universal basic income. Now, if I go talk to 100 people in the town of Canmore, and I ask them the same question, what is the biggest issue facing your community today? 
Now you're going to hear some of those macro issues, infrastructure, housing, uh, wealth inequality, but you're going to get those micro issues as well. You're going to get the pothole in front of my house. You're going to get the park in my area needs upgrade and hasn't been. And I guarantee you've heard this for the last two years. So this is not going to come to a surprise. How do you, as counselor and council, take all the micro issues, the issues that people feel like they are important, and pick the winners and losers? And I say that by saying this. You only have a certain amount of money each year in your budget, and you cannot fix everyone's issue. As much as you try, you can't. I'm not bursting your bubble here. How do you look at people and say, I would love to fix your pothole, but this year Sarah's pothole down the street is a lot worse off because it's been deteriorating for the last three years. Maybe your park needs upgrade, but park in the Southwest needs better upgrades right now. So we have to work, work on that one. How do you lay out all the micro issues and look at them as a council to move your count, your town forward without forgetting the people who live there? Uh, I think in most conversations that I have with people, um, I try and I listen to understand and I try and identify the need that need that that they want to be met um, because it could just be being heard. It could That's be true. an actual action. Sometimes. Yeah. Like, like we have a new intersection in our town and we it was the last council that approved it and it was a council before that that approved the integrated transportation master plan that set out the the i think parameters for how this intersection was going uh to be redesigned and we we won an award for the the redesign but i'll tell like it is the only type of this intersection in all of north america and the light the light standards are on the side of the traffic. So, you know, when you're, you're sitting at a, a traffic light and on the other side of the intersection, you see your, your red, green, and yellow. This is now on the same side as you're stopped. So if you pull up too far, you can't see it. Right. And it, it's, it's a design. It's really kind of, I think comes from a Dutch European style and it's called a protected intersection. You're not allowed to turn right on red lights at all. Everyone gets their turn and there are dedicated bike lanes and pedestrian crossings with stops in the middle. And the, the protected part is it's protected for pedestrians and cyclists, hence the no right turns on red. And the reason why the light poles are on the other side is that it forces you to stop and you cannot intrude into the crosswalk. And, um, we did this during COVID and I, I feel that it was a miscalculation of the level of change that our community could handle at one time because we didn't know what COVID was going to be. And so um, there's a lot of conversations in the community right now because we're moving on to the next section of this roadway intersection leading to the downtown intersection for a complete redesign of that stretch. And so there's a lot of conversations right now where you know, people really don't like the new design and they don't want to see it used to continue the redesign of the road road network. And it's um, for and for that, I think like it's hard because like we just like we can't just come in and spend another 10 million dollars to redo an intersection because some people don't like it. Some people do like it. Right. Like and it's actually it's really effective in terms of the st stats of reducing collisions right so it's kind of this change management it's kind of like making sure people are heard about you know their experience with that type of um a traffic system and then trying to understand how their needs can be met in the next the next phase of redesign um and just acknowledging like he, and just making sure people understand what are our objectives? Like, what are we trying to do? Like, what are we trying to achieve with this? It wasn't random. We didn't just be like, you know, we're just going to go for some, like, we're going to do something no one else has ever done in all of North America. We're going to innovate for no reason, right? It was, it's mode shift, it's climate change. It's like, 
like we talked before about the number of people who come into our community, those are a lot of cars on our roads and in our downtowns. So we have some serious parking traffic and congestion issues. Uh, we also introduced paid parking last year. So I hear a lot about paid parking. Um, and then, you know, trying to understand what are, what are the tweaks? What are the, the things that can be adjusted to reflect their input and needs without completely abandoning the the course we've started on um because i my vision and like as a person who is like trying to bike more i got an e-bike i've been winter biking talk that's scary it's scary to winter bike let me tell you <laughs> i have a stronger i wouldn't want to do this. it um like from that perspective from that user perspective this is amazing change mm -hmm. right because you know i have a dedicated bike lane from where i live right now all the way, like almost all the way to downtown oh wow and so trying to make sure they understand like what are we trying to achieve and that if you agree if you agree that we should be addressing climate change reducing traffic and congestion and trying to get more making space for people on bikes and pedestrians we have so many people walking around our town especially they stay in hotels and they if, if you don't have to drive it's actually a far better experience um it then it, the question is how do we do that and uh and so those are a lot of questions i'm i'm and i, I just kind of try and marinate in it i try and just be like think about it and then at some point in time my brain starts to kind of form like is there a solution here that's possible or is this a, I'm like a more of a, um, this is just this, we have to do it. This, this is how we're doing it. And I get that there are personal preference differences and, and subjectivity here, but, um, I'm not a, I'm not a transportation engineer or road designer. So it would be really inappropriate for me as an elected official to start redesigning the road even though that's what I hear from people. So how can I translate what? that? Into... Counselors aren't everything and everywhere all at once. Like, shouldn't they be like an engineer, a snowplow driver, everything? Because it sounds I, as a former communications person up in Northern Alberta, that's all we got. Why isn't counselor X coming out and uh, shoveling my windrow in front of me? Well, because that's your job. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I joke. And, um, and sometimes, no, sometimes the things that people are worried about or want to see done are actually in the plan. Right. And so it, I just have to reassure them, like, you know, like, like we need a pedestrian bridge from a subdivision where I live on one side of the highway to the other side, because it, everyone just crosses, like walks across the four lane Trans Canada highway through some broken fences because it takes a third the time they're walking the long way across the overpass and people have got it in their head that, that this will never happen be since because the last time it was brought up council was like well we, we can't really spend 10 to 10 to 15 million dollars on, on something for a couple hundred people like we gotta like we have to understand where is this subdivision going and future development and now it's in the capital plan and we're working on an area uh development plan for the entire subdivision which is completely owned by the town and our housing corporation and will be all future um, income appropriate housing of some sort. Because affordable doesn't always as a word fit, but because we have people here, you, you could get people who are earning between them, a couple are earning 150 to 200,000 a year. They, they can't afford to buy a house here. Right. That's, like, so that's... like, and yeah, no. like, like it's it so so we don't so we have we have a doctor shortage right we have like we have a hard time recruiting um our cmp members and staff members and every business is struggling and so so it's not just the the bot the incomes on the bottom that have limited access to housing it's all, all these other income levels too that are now been priced out and so, you know, how do we like, because I think those are important role, like I want doctors, I want nurses and teachers. Um, and no, it's not our job. to house them. The, it, the system should work. 
Um, these people should make enough money to be able to afford a home in the community that they work, but not in Canmore. So how do yeah how do we how do we do something about that? Well, I wish you the best of luck on that quest on that answer. Yeah. But I want to turn. I have to my... some magic beans. <laughs> I have some magic beans. I have a cow that beans. I would like to sell you for those magic beans. <laughs> yeah. So let's do it. Uh, I want to turn to my last segment, and this is the fun segment for me at least. And I kind of already expect to know what I'm about to hear, but I'm going to change it up a little bit. I love tourism. I love tourists. I love visiting communities. I've said, if you come on my show, I will come and spend my hard-earned economic dollars in your community. I'm already planning a trip out to Canmore earlier this year, so I will be in your community anyway. So, counselor, I'm going to ask you a different question than I've asked everyone else. I usually ask, what are the tourist destinations in your community? I'm going to change it up for you. I'm going to say, what are the hidden gems in your community? What are the tourist destinations that people don't know about, but you say, if you come here, you need to do X, Y, and Z, or go to X, Y, and Z? Mm, that's a good one. Um, and I know you can edit this if I need a long pause to think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I feel yeah, like we should put the, I'll let's all go to the movies. <laughs> anyway. Um. There is, for me, there's a couple things that um, uh, just outside town in uh, K Country, Bow Valley Provincial Park, there's a little one kilometer loop trail called Many Springs. And it, it, it's kind of like you take the 1X highway, sort of like you were going to go to CB, which is also a really cool area, but private property um and where Brokeback Mountain was filmed um so in the it, right along this horseshoe the horseshoe dam area and right off highway 1x is the Bow Valley Provincial Park area and this little there's this little you go down it's this loop and you just keep going down there's campgrounds there's campgrounds there's a little day use area at the bottom called Whitefish which is right on the river you're looking right at Yamnuska and you can do like little fires and picnics there. And right before that is this little trail called Many Springs. It's, I have two like um, super spoiled bougie dogs, a Boston Terrier and a French Bulldog Boston. And so they can't do long, hot hikes. They can't, they're not mountain dogs. We're not going for a 10K anywhere, but this is perfect. This trail is perfect for them. And in June and July, when it's wildflower season, this is where you find the most wildflowers in any place that I found in the entire valley. And in fact, it has a, a one species of orchid. Now you think like, do orchids grow in the mountains? Yeah. They do. They, uh, and there's one species of orchid that only grows there. And so like, and it's, it's a spring fed, it's just this little loop spring fred water places if you got beavers making dams and there's just flowers everywhere as you walk through there's shade and it's super quick and i love that that we we will go out you know we'll we'll grab a a timmy's i like the steep tea at the drive through head on the little drive down the highway um and hit that trail um many times uh in the sort of early summer as a little outdoor walk that my dogs can do and I can do. And like, and I just get to look at flowers. Well, um, I have a friend coming from good, Nova Scotia in the summer. So I'll make sure that we, we stop in. Hopefully you can come with us and show us these beautiful wild, wild flowers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jura Creek Canyon is another good one, but there are a lot of places here that were kind of quiet unknowns that are just really popular now. COVID really inundated um, the natural spaces of the provincial parks around us. Um, I like to do grassy lakes, but like, that's not an unknown. Yeah. That is so overknown. And so where do you go? Many... Where do you go in town after a long day, after a stressful day at council or a long day at work, where do you go to decompress in the town? Um, I do walk my dogs. I like riding my bike. Um, I, um, Mountain Juice is the juice bar in town and it's owned by, it's owned by my cousin and his partner. 
And so that's where I know I can get hugs. I can get hugs and I'm like, I can complain about things that I'm not allowed to complain about. <laughs> and he's going to give me a hard time. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm going to get um, something that isn't bad for me because, you know, a, a nice juice smoothie is, is probably more nutritious that, uh, you know, I want like chicken fingers and something with a cheese melted on bread. Those are my stress eating areas. So, you know, the juice bar is a good one. Um, another, uh, a hidden, a nice cool hidden gem is, a, a it's a restaurant, an ice cream shop and a secret speakeasy. And so most people don't know about the secret speakeasy because you have to know about it to access it. Cause there is no door on the street that you can get in. And uh, the restaurant's called 4296. Um, it's owned by um, a really amazing, um, talented chef named Blake Flan and his partner. And they have, and since starting that, and 4296 is the elevation of Canmore in feet. Um, I, I will jokingly call it 1309 because that's meters. So that's, I'll go, I'll meet you at 1309. No. You're not funny, Tanya. Thank you. That's a dad joke. I found it right hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they, they the space next to them became available and they turned the outside of it into an ice cream shop called Sweet Revenge, uh, which I actually, uh, I hope to, like, I, I actually am trying to get that as my extra summer job this year because it would be super low stress and I could just eat ice cream all day. Um, but it's really bougie ice creams, super bougie. Like my favorite Sunday is truffle, it's vanilla ice cream, which is vegan, is vegan ice cream, soft serve with truffle salts, hot honey oil and gold leaf, right? And gold, there's no, there's no, no flavor that gold leaf provides really, right? It's, that's how bougie it is. It's just, you're going to poop gold later. That's it. That's all you get out of that that's so that's the bougiest sunday in the world and it's actually delicious and i crave it and i love it <laughs> it's very expensive i'm actually um, looking forward so to that as well yeah no it's i highly recommend um and you're so kind of right off the creeks so you can and then right behind that between the two is this place it's called bar deja vu bar deja vu and so um you can find them on instagram and you can make reservations and for your reservation, you get given a code. And so you would walk into the restaurant 4296, you give the code and then they take you through the secret door in, in the hallway with the washrooms and you're in bar deja vu. It's not very big. You can't, there's no windows to the outside. So if you, there's no view mountain views, but it's super chic. Um, and that's where I had my election night event with my family. Aww. We were just in the secret speakeasy and everything's purple and pink and those were my colors. So I really liked it. Um, so that's a, that's a really good set of places and with one that's kind of a hidden gem because it's actually hidden. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to finalize um, the interview with this last question. And this is the most important question I've asked the entire interview. This is the million dollar question. In your opinion, counselor, what makes the town of Canmore such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? The people. The, the people who are here are here because they want to be here. And people like me are here, like, we actually hustle to be here. We hu hustle hard, right? Like the struggle is real in this town. So if you're here, it's because, you know, th this is a place that you love. Um, the mountains, uh, the amenities, the hiking, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. You could just like to be like, sit on patios. There are an amazing spectrum of special interests and, and passions that make people want to be here, um, being close to nature, um, but regardless of, of what the specific thing is, if you're here, you don't just randomly accidentally live in Canmore. You're not stuck. Like people aren't stuck here because they leave if it doesn't work for them. So the people who are here are sacrificing to be here. 
Um, they're working harder to be here than they'd have to work if they were anywhere else. And that's like a level of dedication and passion for your community that inspires me to continue to be here too. So it's, yeah, the people. And I'm a big fan of like, you know, community doesn't just happen. You make it happen. And that's where that service thing comes in, right? Like actually doing things that give back to your community and being of service, that's how you actually get a feeling of community. And a feeling of, you know, of knowing your neighbor. You know, I know people who have lived here a long time, but don't have a sense of community. They don't go out. They, they, they feel that it's changed so much that the community is not there. But they also have not invested in community by being involved. So they might walk out downtown or at the grocery store and not know anyone they see. But that doesn't happen to me. Right. So it, you know, it, it is what you make it, you gotta, you gotta put it in to get it back. And there we have like the most amazing volunteers in our town. I think we have like more nonprofits per capita than a lot of places. Like a lot of people bring their passion projects and start like they're here and they're doing it. Um, Cause Canada is a really good example that, you know, uh, an international nonprofit just headquartered in Canmore. Um, because the people who started it were just passionate. This is where they want to be in order to do the, their passion. So that's probably a long enough answer because I could talk about things forever. Counselor, <laughs> and this is a limited time podcast. <laughs> it, it's an hour. We try to keep it within an hour. We hit that <laughs> mark. So, Counselor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. And I want to say this to you, and I don't say it to everyone, but I'm going to say it to you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of your community, for making your uh, community a better place for everyone who lives there. And thank you for advocating for your community like you've done today. Um, we need more people in the municipal realm to do that. And I appreciate when people take time out of their busy schedules to sit down and actually advocate, but also talk about their communities in such a passionate way like you've done. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was great. It was a great conversation. And thank you for doing a podcast where you feature municipal politics, as I think it's uh, I think it's really good. And I think that a lot of people don't realize how hard we work um, and that there's very little glory at this level. <laughs> but uh, but, you know, um, you will often I find like the hardest working, most caring people are the ones who actually will sit on a town council. Because, you know, they they sometimes got to eat a lot of dirt. They certainly do. So with that, I want to remind everyone, go put down social media for at least 10 minutes a day. Go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.